Okay, we're recording now. Okay. I guess I should just start then. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and renewed by Governor Maura Healy, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instructions on the Board of Health posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings as soon as it is technologically possible. After this meeting, all approved Board of Health minutes are posted on our website once they are approved by the board. I will now open the May 9th meeting of the Board of Health at 5.03 p.m. So I guess we're mostly here. That's good. Um, so I guess I need to take attendance, right? Um, Risha? Here. Lauren? Here. Great. Uh, Maureen, here. And we know Tim is away, and we're waiting um, for Emula. Do you want to text her just to be sure, Pico? Um, I just sent her an email. I don't know that I have her. Well, I guess I can text her. I have her cell phone number. I can try that. I've never reached her that way before, but. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I know she does text, so. Okay, I'll I'll do that. Okay. Um, so our first task is to review and receive minutes. Um, we have outstanding minutes from March, but I don't think we have a quorum to vote on those minutes uh, because the only attendees in that meeting were Tim, Misha, and I, and Tim is away. So I think we have to put that on hold unless you learn something different Kiko I did learn something different um I checked in with um Angela Mills the assistant uh you know to the town manager today and she said that even though people weren't at the meeting if they they're able to review the minutes look over them and see that they are a reasonable um sort of summary of a discussion that would have happened in response to the agenda items that were scheduled for that meeting, that they can approve the content even though they weren't at the meeting themselves. Okay. And that it does need to be done in the context of a meeting and not over email, which was the question I posed to you right. earlier today. Right. So so that can be done without a quorum okay. of folks who are in attendance. Okay. So um I looked at those minutes and I didn't find any concerns. Does, uh, Risha, did you have any any corrections or concerns on, on that? I did not. Let me just double check. It's been a little while. I didn't write any notes. Okay. Um, Lauren, I don't know if, did you have a chance to look at the March um, minutes? Uh, no, I didn't review the minutes. I know I was there for um, part of the meeting, but um, I'm sure the minutes are okay, but I, I didn't review them. Sorry. Do you feel comfortable voting to accept? Or... Sure, sure. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to accept the minutes of the March 14th meeting of the Board of Health. Oh. I, will, I will motion to accept. I'll second that. Um, Risha? Uh, what's the problem? Oh, just, I think it's uh, I or yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Lauren? Yes. Maureen, yes. So the March minutes are, are accepted. And next we have the April minutes um, that we need to review. And I wasn't at that meeting. I did watch it, 
on uh, YouTube. And I didn't have any concerns about the minutes. Anyone else have any corrections or? Um... Oh, can I just make a correction or a question? At the mm -hmm. last, that April was the last meeting that I yeah. was at, but I didn't. I was. I didn't stay for the whole meeting. Was I in attendance at the March meeting? No, I don't. It says no. no. I think you weren't feeling okay. well. Okay. Okay. Um. I remember. Well, anyway, well, I voted yes already, so I guess that's fine. Okay. Okay. So now we're at April, where there was um people who attended parts of the meeting, but if we've had a chance to go over that, and I wasn't there, like I said, but I did review the um the video, and I've reviewed the minutes, and I feel like they are reflecting the meeting. So um, I guess we need a motion to approve the April 11th, 2024 minutes. I can also motion to accept those. Okay. And a second? Yes, second. Okay. And um, the vote is Risha? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Maureen? Yes. All right. So the minutes of April 11th, 2024 are accepted. All right. Um, and now the question comes of public comment. Uh, if there are any members of the public in attendance, do you see anyone, Kyle? We have Maria, but I think she's going to come in for the tobacco in, in a minute or so. But I don't see anyone uh, that are that wants to make public comment. Maria. Uh, she's gonna talk. Help us talk through the. Um, I think the hemp. The okay. later in the meeting, she's gonna come in later in the meeting as a panelist. No, that would be no, Chef that's not, that's Sabar, Cheryl. Who joined us yet? Yeah. So okay. Maria is a community member, and um, Maria, if you can hear this, if you do want to make co public comment at this point, please do raise your hand so we can promote you to panelist. I'm not seeing anything. So I think she's just here to listen. Okay. Um, I had a public comment. Um, well, I wanted to make a uh, announcement during public comment, if that's okay. I shared it with um, Kiko about the safe routes to school. Um, yeah. the, the planning committee... Um, so they Lauren, I'm I, oh, sorry, just okay. sorry to interrupt you for a second. <laughs> okay. Um, I emailed you back, but it was later in the day. Um, okay. I, I thought that it would be really good for you to make this public comment at town council meeting. Ha has that happened yet? Um, no, but this this was um, I, I don't see the reason why it wouldn't be made at this meeting where I'm a member of. Um, well, it's. I, yeah, I mean, public comment is the time for people who aren't members of the board to make comments. Um, so if you wanted to make this as a public comment so that it's enshrined as a comment from a member of the community, then it would be at the town council meeting where you're not a member. It would be a great place to make the comment. Otherwise, it could be sort of part of something we talk about under the director's update. But technically, since you're a board member, then you're not a member of the public because you're a oh, I know. part of the board. Does that make sense? Yes, but I'm saying during public, the public comment period, if there's no public comment, is it okay if I just make a quick statement about the safe routes to school? It's just going to take 30 seconds. Um, so I guess, Maureen, you're the chair of this meeting. I'm just relaying what I know about protocol, but I'll leave it to you to, to make it. To it we can bring it up in within the director's upstate in, in terms of... Okay. 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 This don't we won't forget. I think the only problem with that, if I remember correctly, is you you have to get off early. Is that right, Lauren? Yeah. So can I just okay, say so it then, now? <laughs> then let's do it now. Then let's do it now as an okay. early version of this is not a public uh, comment. <laughs> okay, it'll be quick. They they sent me um some talking points, but I can't open um my email at the same time. But it was the um the safe routes to school they had about 130 participants from all the elementary schools um fort river crocker farm and wildwood uh 50 from 
Fort River Crocker Farm had about 50 um, families and, and riders and walkers and, and um, Wildwood had 30. And so they just wanted to um, share that with the, the board and with the public health department. Nice, that's great. Thank you, it sounds like it was a great event. When did they do this? Do you remember? It was May 1st. <laughs> okay, May 1st. Nice way to start the month. <laughs> but I think that was a really nice day. I don't, I but, does, does the Board of Health get to like push for sidewalks or uh, to make biking easier? <laughs> Is that a thing within our remit? It's a part of a healthy community to have accessible walking and bicycling paths. Um, okay, noted. Um, all right, so we're at old business, and that old business continues to be tobacco regulations. Um, uh, and we're making progress, but there's a lot to it. Um, and I think what we the piece we decided to tackle this time has been just kind of the, the violations, how we, how we um, structure violations, both fines and suspension of sales. Um, they, basically, there are two different structures that, two different possibilities. One is to do what's called unified um, structure for, for violations and, and just follow the pattern that the state set out for the violations of the state laws. Um, and those, those uh, are a fines for the first violation of $1,000, for the second of $5,000, uh, $3,000, and for the third, Oops, no, that's wrong. For the first, it's $1,000. For the second, it's $2,000. And for the third, it's $5,000. And then for suspension, it's zero for the first violation unless it sales to a minor. And then for the second, it's I, seven consecutive business days. And for the third, it's 30 consecutive business days. And some of those might be up to, and those might be the max maximums. Um, if, I'll just jump in. I think yep. if we decide to do it in this way that we align with the state, we have to choose whether it's up to or a specific. A number. certain state. But yeah, so those for the, the state, it has up to, but we probably want to just have a, a date, a number in mind. Um, Right, so it's for the first violation of, I think they say one to 30 business days, I think for their um, sales to a minor, for the second violation, it's up to seven. And for the third violations, it's up up to 30, seven from seven to 30, between seven and 30. And so that's, I, I, I listened to the last meeting and it seemed like people felt that the violation fine seemed low for, for at the 100, 200, 500, 100, 300, 500, whatever it is, but starting at $100 and capped at about $500. Um, our, our current ones are 100, 200, 300. 300, yeah. Yeah, here they are. So... Um, well, yeah, I mean, so I think we're really asking Lauren. Because yeah, I know, because we, we've kind of <laughs> talked about this. We're Lauren, really what do you think? Um, and we'd love to hear, Lauren, if you have any thoughts on whether it makes sense to just keep our penalties the same as the states. And so no matter what you violated, whether it's a state or a local ordinance, that you would have the same sort of fine and suspension structure or if there should be separate ones for the ones that we have implemented locally. Um, I'm looking for my 
paperwork. I have to put my paperwork. Um, so I cannot answer um, right now without something in front of me to go off of. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to try to explain it verbally. I don't, I, I, there's not actually that much text that you would need to read. It, the, it's really, right now, we have a completely different structure for anything that's a local violation. And so we have a diff, much lower fines and then um, lower suspension days. Um, and so one option is to just align the two. The other is, is to keep them separate. And then we have to come up with what our uh, fines and suspensions are for local violations. And just to give you a list, the local violations are um, exceeding the number of permits allowed in Amherst, the prohibition of smoke smoking bars, the minimum pricing on sales of cigars, the prohibition of sale of blunt wraps, the prohibition of the sale of tobacco products in educational institutions, vending machines, sale within healthcare institutions, self-service displays, and then other. And actually, I think the suspensions yeah, I, are similar. Okay. They're not really different. Does the state have any regulations around those things? Self-service displays? Vending machines. Oh, the, the one thing they do have is the state. The state does have uh, a violation for self-service displays at the regular retail outlets, but that's uh, waived for uh, adult only. So if we decided to have um, no self-service displays, it, it means it would apply to to all, all, all sellers of tobacco, including the adult only shops. Um. Yeah, I think, I think what we talked about last time was whether it's kind of an interesting collection of local violations, some of which align with the idea of a fine and some of which do not. Like the limited number of permits is not something that would be a fining issue because the town decides how to issue those permits. So that maybe there would need to be some change in the language so that those kinds of things which are important for the town, like limiting the number of permits, um, wouldn't really be, wouldn't have an associated fine with it. So we'd have a collection of things. I think we needed to decide, you all needed to decide what are the things that we still want to say are in the local violations list. And then how do we want to penalize them? Is it according to the state structure or is it according to a different local structure? I felt like that was the only one that doesn't seem to fit into this. And it's kind of included, it's been included in these fine structures forever. Um, it won't happen, um, but. Um, I think the other one is the smoking bars because you couldn't open a smoking bar without going through some kind of a permitting process with the town. Well, so you wouldn't ever be fined for having a smoking bar. Well, do you right? have to go through it uh, with the town, or what if you just? It's the same permit, isn't it? It's you just have a permit to sell, but then you have a smoking bar. I mean, I guess they sell a little bit of food, right, and a little, but not sort of all incidental things. Is that require? Does that require a permit from the town for something else? Um, so I'm not the expert here, but I'm pretty sure that any kind of business, yeah. you're opening a new business, you need to get permitted with the town. Is there, so, I mean, I, I don't see it in the state, but I mean, what is the penalty for doing something without a permit? I guess there's a sales without a local permit for smoking bars and retail tobacco stores only is in the state. So that feels like it covers ours. Um, we're just saying you can't have, we won't permit you for smoking bars. So not allowing them. Right. Um, would right. somebody like make one in the back room of their shop or something? I, you know, I, I guess I, I see it as impossible too, but then I kind of wonder if, if it could sneak in somewhere with a creative 
<laughs> creative. Yeah, I, I don't see it, I mean, as a harm of keeping it. Um, the the maximum number of permits is is not the fault of the person getting it if we issued more than than we were supposed to, right? Like that's right. that that is a non-penalty to the person who received it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that one seems different, but the rest are things that you would penalize. Now, if we want to penalize them at the same level or different than the state, that's the next question. Or do we want to penalize them at the same level across the board is the other question. Do you get the same penalty for opening a clandestine smoking bar in the back room of your <laughs> restaurant as for selling a cigar at the wrong price? Same penalty? I think, you know, Maureen and I talked a bit about this. The state has the same problem. Right. Yeah. They have a bunch here that are you didn't put a sign up in the right and place. Then, <laughs> and then also you sold without a permit. Right. And those are the exact same level of fines and the exact same suspension rules. So yeah. my sense is because we're already working within something that is uh, a little skewed, it, it doesn't it doesn't help to try to make our part you know, super equitable and, and just like the, I, I feel like if, if the other one was more sort of logical in that way, then I would say we should keep ours, but. Um, yeah, but trying yeah. to make decisions based on what the perceived um, harms are, hasn't yeah. been by the Which state. Probably why they didn't do it either, right? Mm -hmm. No, uh, it's a it's an it's a perfect perspective. What you're saying, Risha, makes makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so um, I'm probably overthinking it. <laughs> and I, I mean, my I'll just give my perspective is that um, some of our local things are much worse than some of the state ones, and some of them are not as bad. And there's a huge variety in both sides. So on both lists, there's a huge you know, from a very minor thing that probably is not um, having a huge health risk, it's more procedural to a thing that is, is a clear, you know, a violation, um, you know, selling to someone who shouldn't have it or letting people into the shop that shouldn't be there. Um, and so my, I, I, I fail to find a logic that allows me to say that should be lower or higher. <laughs> than the state, which leads me to, well, then let's just have them all be the same because I don't I don't have a logic that tells me what else to do. And so that's where I sort of land is if we keep the same for all of them, that probably just is easy. Uh, you know, everyone knows what's gonna happen no matter what they do. And I think the enforcement seems to be how should I say a little flexible if someone goes in, it sounds to me like if someone goes into a shop, the inspector, and they notice that the sign is missing, they'll provide them with the sign, or if it's in the wrong place, they'll tell them where to put it. Um, or if their prices on the cigars is, is too low, they'll tell them they need to make it higher and kind of correct it in the moment and not fine it. Um, I suppose if someone kept doing that over and over, then that would that would be different but if it's a if it's just oh, oh yeah, we move things around and now this sign is over here and not over there where it should be or um so i think there's some consideration in enforcement that reflects <laughs> the severity of the yeah the infractions but. right no you summarized that perfectly maureen yes and i i did confirm that with meredith that when their tobacco compliance officers go out to do these educational sessions the majority of the violations about signage and whatnot are corrected on site in the moment and so there isn't the feeling that you would then be levying a thousand dollar fine because you fix it right there and then and if it but if it becomes a historic persistent or egregious kind of violation then the Board of Health might want to consider finding that establishment. Mm -hmm. So you're right about the flexibility with the enforcement. I would also assume if if the person who's selling a cigar for you know 20 cents less than it should be sold is like, oh, apologies, let me change that right now, then there's not a, a, a penalty. If they were like, no, 
I insist that this is what I'm selling it for, then you've given the person the option to penalize um, and. Mm -hmm. Lauren, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's kind, like I said, it's kind of hard to follow without something in front of me, but I do remember from um, the last meeting that um, Kiko mentioned when I guess some um, inspectors had asked, it was like for so minor violations. So if we don't have like the proper uh, response to when there are infractions. I just feel like um, that is something that we need to take into account if we're asking people to pay for fines or we're trying to, you know, switch would be a level of fines that would be appropriate if there's no, you know, one to um, enforce as whatever the, the fines would be to enforce um, what um, we are asking retailers to like be in Lauren, you're no. breaking it, so it's hard to understand. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, I'm not holding the phone too close to my mouth. Um, I, I think I'm still trying to figure out what we're, what's the intention and what is, you know, what are we trying to enforce? And if we don't have the proper um, vehicles to um, let retailers know what our expectations are and to follow up with that, then whatever whatever penalties that we do put um, in our regulations are in in the town's regulations, it, it kind of, to me, doesn't, doesn't mean much if we don't have a way to enforce it. And, and it's not clear as to what we're actually expecting the re retailers to do. So I'm sorry if that is kind of vague, but it's kind of like I still don't really know what the intention is of, of you know, our, our questioning you know, uh, comparing the our our regulations to the state, because I don't think we've clarified what our intention would be and and what we need to do. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I I think on this one, unlike so, we had talked about you know the the tobacco quiz and those things that are tough to send inspectors and oversee, and that the, it didn't really feel like it was something that anyone was checking, um, and we didn't have the resources to do so. The rest of these, the violations, there are people who go out. Is it twice a year, Kiko? Uh, yeah. Um, that go out and they take our they take the states which they know because that's for all of their um inspections in various towns and then they take our towns and so they are checking all of these things and have a way to enforce um and, and the question it so that doesn't seem to be a problem on these sets of things we have not added any new violations to what used to be there uh, the list i read off for local are the ones that were there previously and so i think what we're trying to determine is if if the state's violations are 1000 2000 3000 and ours are 100 200 300 those are quite different and is there a um is there a reason that they're that different i will just say i looked at neighboring municipalities to see what they were all doing um and a, and several of them were just they didn't make any differentiation. If it was a local violation or a state violation, you got the same fines, you got the same suspensions. Uh, a subset then did have a differentiation and the ones that had not been reviewed in the past like two years said 100, 200, 300 like ours. 
Uh, the ones that had been reviewed more recently had higher, uh, I, I want to say like $500 kind of levels. Um, and so I think there's a movement statewide to sort of move towards um, an alignment between the state fines and the local fines is is what I sort of am reading by looking at the neighboring municipalities. It, does that does that help your question of intent? I guess, um, but when you increase the fines um, and I'm, yeah, I, I would have to be reminded what the, the, the fines are for. You said signage and some other stuff and not so selling. The, the state ones are the different signs, you know, selling without a permit. Um, sorry, I have to read. No, tobacco products. That's a big one. That's a major one, flavored tobacco products. Um, only, only low lower uh, five micrograms per per uh, vape at, at retail tobacco stores. Um, there's there are a lot of different. It's a it's a basket of different um, things of different significance from signage to actually what they're selling and who they're selling to, and especially to people under the age of one. That's sort of the main one of the major. Uh, pushes of, of all of this rate of all of these regulations. I think that's probably the most important of them. And also the flavored tobacco, because that is easier to get used to and prefer smokers who are starting to smoke. And vapes are more appealing if they're flavored. So um, yeah. those are the state ones. And then the local ones are um, similarly all over the place, but there's You've opened the wrong kind of institution that you shouldn't have had. There's the the vending machines, the roll your own machines, blunt wraps, uh, and then a minimum pricing on cigars. Yeah, and like no coupons or discounts for cigarettes or that's on uh, the state side. Yeah. Yeah, that's the state side. Right. I got my list mixed up. <laughs> um mm. And and I guess we re restrict selling tobacco in in healthcare institutions and in educational institutions. Um. Well, um, I, I guess the the bottom line for me um, is: would the regulations be more protective of the public, or are they? you know, being more lenient to the retailers. And I think, you know, fines uh, should um, be preventative. And and I, I think I had asked before, like, where do the fines go? Like, where, where does that money go toward? Um, so I, those are just my, remaining thoughts and questions. I I don't have a specific answer. Um, so Lauren, thanks for reminding me about that. I did ask about, I did ask that question about what happens with those fines and they just go into the general coffers. So they don't come to the health department. Any fines that are levied or any like permit fees that are levied by the town, they go into the general pool. And so they're used to kind of balance the budget for the town in general, so they don't come back to pay for public health related programs. That's not how it works. Mm. Just so you know. <laughs> and like, I when, think do you when you say general, do you mean like the capital budget or just the general the budget for the town? The sort of oh okay. un, un, yeah, not the not not dedi not dedicated to a specific thing, just general budget. And then when we when the finance folks do the budgeting, they're able to see how much money is in this fund and apply it to certain things that might be needed. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't come back to public health. Like in some, in some, there are some revenue streams that are dedicated for certain, not here in the town, but just generally speaking, there are sometimes dedicated revenue streams that go towards public health activities, but that's not the case with these sorts of fines. Right. I could understand that, but I know that as well the 
uh, public health department has a minimal budget. So again, like what if money, it depends on what money is being used for and and what what is the message with the with the fine? Is is it is it to deter, is it to prevent, or is it just to remind? You know, I, I'm sorry I'm speaking kind of generally, but I I don't have all the details in my head or in front of me. So that's that's kind of just how I'm feeling just mm -hmm. with what I I would think both the fines and the suspensions, which might be even more costly in some ways than the fines themselves, um, are to deterrence. You know, how, how you know, I don't know if we have a measure of efficacy and how, you know, relative to the, the, the amount of the fine or the length of suspension, but, you know, I'm sure businesses don't want to lose money and, and that's, uh, thought to be a deterrent, um, and, um, and a motivation to kind of follow the, follow the rules. Um, yeah. And, and, and just to summarize, um, about, I think Lauren had asked this question of why we're doing this. And I think that you summarized it, Risha, which is that it's important to revisit these regulations every so often. There's a movement to kind of align local fines with state fines, you know, there's inflation. So you might want to look to see whether your fees are still relevant. These are all the reasons that we're looking at these tobacco regulations, which are in place to provide some, you know, guidance and constraint uh, or some, you know, monitoring of tobacco sales to limit it getting into the hands of minors in particular, but also just to make sure that there are these structures in place that, um, you know, regulate how tobacco is sold in our community. So these regulations are in place. We're updating them because things change. The landscape changes. That's why we're doing it. And then, yes, the fee structure does exist as a disincentive or as a way to kind of keep people to follow the rules. And I underscore, I mean, I definitely think you're right, Maureen, that in my experience of having had to find one tobacco retailer for underage sales, um, it the the license suspension was a much bigger deterrent than a thousand dollar fine. Mm -hmm. That that was what they were most upset about or concerned about. So it is an effective, you know, deterrent and helps to keep people remind them of why it's important to follow these regulations. And I, I think the, I, the question of whether, what are the fines supposed to do is, is an important one to consider as we're setting them. And I, I guess, as I think about that, $100 doesn't feel like much of a deterrent anymore in this economy. <laughs> um, and, and so that, yeah, that somehow feels like it, it doesn't, it might not do the trick. It might not do... The, the deterrent that we're trying to set it up to do. Yeah, in a sense from watching the last meeting that that was Tim's sense too, that that, that was too low. Too low, you know, the, and then, then that, there seemed almost to be a consensus about the fines being quite low com compared in today's economy. Um, my recollection is the fines were all that level, you know, back in 2017 or 18 or whatever, when we, when 2019, when the state uh, revamped their rules and those fines seemed very high at the time, a thousand, uh, <laughs> starting at a thousand dollars, but now it doesn't quite seem as, <laughs> as crazy um, as it did then. So we aren't trying to establish a vote on anything here or, it, you know, the, the the way that we're moving through these tobacco regulations is to get a sense of where people are um, and then we will put it all together in that way and then send it to everyone for a review and vote. Um, and so, Lauren, do you have, are, are you leaning one way or the other in terms of the fine structure or keeping it different or keep doing it the same as the state? Um, I think our local fines sound kind of low. 
So um, I would be more to increase the fines. And um, yeah, I think um, this is including the, the cigar pricing as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fine for, yeah, not ex uh, under cutting the minimum price of a cigar, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just, I think I would be for increasing <laughs> as much as possible. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We also don't have two people here, so we're not making any decisions. It's just a, like, where do we want to head with this? And we'll put something out and then people can look at it as a whole and say yes or no. The, um, the other question, I guess, that seems straightforward that we might want to just talk about while we have a few minutes before our next topic is whether we want to allow um, self-service um, counters at adult-only tobacco sales outlets. And self-service means you can walk up like you're buying a candy bar and pick it up and take it to the to the cashier and pay for it as opposed to things being behind the counter. Um, so I, I, and I, you know, understand that pretty clearly in the uh, all ages, you know, non-age restricted retail outlets, because you don't want them where they are easily accessed. Um, in the adult only stores, the, you have to be 21 to get in and uh, is there a reason to ban, you know, to say we don't allow that kind of sale? I don't know. I think the current store is so small that they probably don't have room for much, uh, much else, but clearly other, there, there may be other, other adult only retail retailers that would be, have a different, uh, I, I guess I don't feel like it would offer much public health benefit. I mean, you're you're in a store that is meant pretty exclusively for tobacco sales. Mm -hmm. it, it it I guess not having a self service is a step toward not having someone you know rob the store and run right. off. They may and not want that themselves, right? That's something that they shouldn't have, but they shouldn't have been allowed in anyway. Once they're in, I'm not sure we're adding much protection to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, it, it doesn't feel that important to me as a, a measure to protect. Right. I, I, I started thinking about that way too, when I realized there was already a state regulation for the non-age restricted outlets. Um, and I, you know, I, mean, I think it keeps helps to keep cigarettes and other tobacco products out of the hands of youth who, but I think the stores themselves probably will want them behind the counter too, because they're expensive and, and easy to pocket. Um, so, um, but in, inside of a, an adult only store they they could decide what makes sense for their particular um retail outlet to me i don't know if that's any thought if you have any thoughts about that idea lauren i think Rish and i have immersed ourselves in these re regulations lately and so it it's a little easier to think about them because we've been going through them regularly. Um, but I didn't know if you had any concerns or thoughts about that. Well, I I guess I just have a question. When you said a vending machine, but they but they can easily take it themselves. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. No, it's self service. It's, it's, we didn't oh, it's self serve. They're self -serve. Oh, not vending. It's okay. Okay. Like out on it, be just like out on the shelves. I think as opposed to behind the counter. I think that's what that means. Okay. 
it's yeah that it that they would have you'd it would be like buying other things in a store where you pick it up in the aisle and take it to the cashier and clearly we don't want those and the state doesn't want those in the you know general um convenience stores mm -hmm. but does that make a difference in an adult only retail outlet you know where you have to be over 21 to get in and they don't really sell anything but um tobacco products but uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to sound ignorant. <laughs> Go for but it. Where, where, where do they only sell tobacco products? Well, there's only one store that's like that in this town right now. And it's, I forget what it's the name, the name is. It's called Lazy Lungs. <laughs> in that alley. Behind the CVS. There's CVS, that alley that goes okay. in. Yep. And it's, okay. I have there, but Kiko has, an, and it's quite small. So, but there was a place, it was an adult only store that gave up that tobacco license. And that was mm -hmm. one down on Route 9, is it? Um, It's it's called Wildside. It's on... um. Gosh, I'm forgetting the street. It's where there are several liquor stores on that street, actually. Um, just I think south, a couple blocks south of where we are right now. I can't remember. Yeah, I think street. it's yeah. the nine uh, yeah. uh, extension, that, kind of. Yeah, like the, yeah. you're right. Yeah, yeah. Goes towards past Amherst College and right uh, yeah. down on the flat part before you get to Southeast Street yep. and while we're we're Fort River and yeah, everything that's else. right. Mm -hmm. But they now don't have a tobacco license, so they're not selling. Right. But it used to be a, a larger store that sold tobacco and other paraphernalia. Right. Now they just do the other stuff. So, mm. so yeah, there's currently wow. just in this in town. And I already forgot the question. Are we? Are we? <laughs> are we saying? That? I'm sorry. Are we saying that we could not allow them to have these single served tobacco products or we would what say, are we saying? They'll be behind the counter, even though oh, we're, we're saying that we, we can have a regulation that says they should be behind the counter or they will yeah. be behind the counter. And, and okay. I think we already did in the past. And the question is, do we want to keep it? The state has one that it can't be for an all ages place anywhere but behind the counter. But we had oh. previously also in adult stores. And I think some of us have thought about it. We're wondering if that's a value add or just getting a little bit too <laughs> nitpicky with how they're running their business. Well, seeing that there's only one, um, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, that's that's where we have to think of like what would the trend be? What would what would the trend be? Would there be more um, stores like that, or that would come into the town? I'm sorry for the noise. Um, and. I don't think we should be relying on the retailers to necessarily make the decision for us. So I, I think we should make the decision and not the retailer. So you keep, keep this, this, the uh, no cell service like we have already for everybody is your thought i would say yes okay, okay. Yeah. well as you said we only have three people here so um so we have a couple different opinions on this one but but yeah and we need to yeah and just so y'all know just so you, i've been in so the way lazy lungs is set up 
because there won't be another one, right? We're not going to open new tobacco stores to, to Lawrence. Right. You know, Unless somebody are... else switches over. To... Right, true. But, but it's not like a new retailer can come into town because um, yeah. the tobacco permits are limited. So, um, and we don't do new ones. But anyway, when you walk into Lazy Lungs, it has, this side is the all ages side. And then this side is the adult side. And it's very small. It actually does not have much product in it. And all the tobacco is behind, is in a glass case you know, but when you walk in, so it's not freely accessible. And they don't sell tobacco in the other side, right? They sell um, other. That's right. Yes. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's possible that another retailer or somebody buys a, a one and decides to make it into a adult only tobacco outlet, but it, most of the others are convenience stores or liquor stores. So it seems unlikely that that's the yeah. route that that would take without a new owner or a totally new. Yeah. I mean, I think Risha put it really well is like, there's questionable public health benefit to this particular piece. Like I, it just seems like not, not the thing to get, well, put a lot of energy into because of all the things that are out there, this is probably going to have the least public health benefit or less public health benefit than some other things. So, all right. Um, I guess that wraps up what we can talk about today. Um, and... Can we outline, Maureen, can you outline what's still remaining to decide just so we can sort of think about the process and how much longer this is going to take? Um, what just, did I have? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I don't, I'm trying to remember now. We decided not to talk about it. <laughs> that I forgot about it. Um, I think I can remember the couple the of other issues. Were, yeah. Oh, yeah. We want to talk about... Um, I thought we did. We decided we didn't need to talk about it, which is why we didn't bring it up. We're trying to make the wording. I think... Yeah. I don't think it, there, it, there are any changes that we're trying to, uh, trying to um, discuss. So we're going to keep, you know, the number... Uh, we have right now a limit of 14 is it uh tobacco retail correct uh, yeah but if someone should give up uh a permit and there isn't a buyer for their for their store that permit will ex will be taken back by the town and then there will only be 13 possible tobacco sales sale retailers so i think that's called a reducing cap so we'll if if they go out of business if they they aren't transferred to a new owner of the business then it's gone so gradually the number will likely go down they already have gone down in the last four years and i think probably the pandemic had somewhat of a hit on that but it went from 18 four years ago to 14 now so there was a loss of some permits um so we weren't planning on changing that and the other thing with just some rules about uh, not being within 500 feet of a school, and I think that's a state regulation, um, but also how close they can be together. And we have some regulations about that, and we're not planning to change that either. The idea is we didn't want to have an adult-only store and a regular outlet be really the same business basically right in the same space so that i think there's not a lot it's just been wording that that we wanted to clarify better we wanted to make it more clear mm -hmm. it it's quite it's a little bit confusing uh, uh so we wanted to clarify that so that and i don't think i mean i think there's I don't think there's anything else we're changing, right? We no, I mean, I, I think, Kiko, I, I think this was it. These were the last discussions to have. And then it's, you know, we will draft what we think we've understood from people. We'll flag where there's, you know, these were decisions that we think we understood, but people can change their mind if they've thought about it more or we haven't taken any votes or made any decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and revise, you know, work on the wording that Marina is talking about, make sure it's as clear as possible, and then send it around to the group for a final review discussion vote. Um, so it still takes a while, but it there's no more discussions on their own. 
-hmm. Okay. So in terms of timing, is that something that you think the two of you would be able to do before the next meeting? Or like, how do you envision this going from here? Possibly. Yeah, I think it's possible. I think, you know, I, I wouldn't expect it to pass through a vote on the first showing of it right that that next meeting i would I'd be, I'd be very surprised if everyone got a chance to read all of the things and had thought it all through and it was very clear and no further discussion needed um but it's possible <laughs> <laughs> okay Great. it's always good to be optimistic um so then the plan would be for you to at least put together some sort of a draft for people to react to in the next meeting in june and, mm -hmm. and to see how that looks and whether there's a need to further edit or, or what from there. Yeah, Maureen and I haven't compared schedules for the next month, but that would be ideal if we can make that happen. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Um, and we had talked to, you know, Cheryl had helped us earlier and we would love it if we could get her view on some of the things that we wording that we added to it so if that we can do all those things in the next month that would be fantastic okay that's great and then hopefully um she'll be joining us in the next 10 minutes so maybe we can sort of as long as we'll have her with us we can ask her what her month looks like and whether she'll be available to sort of assist with some of these last minute things okay good um I don't know what happened to Premila. I didn't hear back from her and I thought she would jump on at 5.30, but she's not here. So I hope she's okay. Me too. I hope I haven't heard anything. So yeah. I don't um, much this today and I just make sure I didn't have anything from earlier, but I think she would have sent it to you too, Kiko. Yeah, and I checked with Kyle, and he didn't hear from her either, so I'm not sure what happened. I don't think from this month. So, well, go ahead. 10 minutes, maybe, right? Until Cheryl's planning to join us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, she did accept the invite, so I'm, and she, I sent her the agenda, so I think she knows that it starts at six ten. I mean, we could start the discussion based on what we've heard. Um, Maureen, you and I were in a presentation, and we have some materials that we could sort of review with people, or we could, I guess, take a break until six ten. I'm not sure how you want to handle it. Um, you could give us a little of the uh the director's update or skip ahead like, like yeah. for minutes or something. We actually have Cheryl in here right now. I can oh, okay. it. Terrific. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> I mean. Oh, there she is raising her hand. Okay. Um, so should we go ahead and promote Cheryl to a panelist? There she is. There Great. She is. She's coming on. Thank you. And Maureen, if you want to give a summary of what we've learned and what we're trying to do with, with this agenda item, that would be great. Uh, I don't know. I can try. <laughs> it's a it's a little complicated. Um, welcome, Cheryl. Hi. 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 I'm on. Just for people who don't know, Cheryl is the executive director of the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, and she's a lawyer, and she really knows about all these difficult questions about tobacco regulations and and the uh, complications of this hemp derived products that's uh, emerging. Um, basically, I think we mo might have spoken about it before, but it's complicated. I guess a few years ago, hemp was legalized to grow for non uh non drug use if it had a very low percentage of thc in it 
Um, and it's theoretically could be used for rope and fabric and all kinds of things. And, um, and also CBD was allowed in products that weren't to be consumed is my understanding. Um, however, since then, um, the hemp has been used in different ways that people didn't really anticipate when they made this regulation and that there is CBD now in many things that are consumed, gummies, drinks, uh, whatever. Um, and also there are cannabinoids, which are naturally occurring in hemp, but in tiny amounts, especially like the Delta-8 THC and Delta-10 THC are examples. The Delta, and although they occur in hemp, they're in such small amounts that they really aren't, um, couldn't be commercially used. So the way that those products are, have developed is they are synthesized from CBD. And so the Delta-8 and Delta-10 and several other cannabinoids are in many products and they're called synthetic cannabinoids. Um, and they're appearing in our our store shelves in like convenience stores and smoke shops and wherever mm -hmm. um, without any kind of regulation and without um, any known concentrations or contaminants or anything. And they're in edibles, chewables, uh, drinkables. They're in all kinds of products. And, and it is something that youth have access to and in, and they they are um hallucinogen i mean they they are similar they similar kind of uh neurological changes as uh delta 9 thc so so it's considered to be a, a an access for people under the age of 21 and in local stores uh, across the country, basically, and across the state. And there are not many clear law. There are laws that say they are not legal, but the enforcement is. Um, um, you're basically you're basically doing the presentation that I have to give you. So um, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> no, well, you you've you've hit the nail on the head. Um, so so the reason in the olden days, we had hemp, old fashioned hemp plants and old fashioned drug plants. And the hemp plants looked very different than the drug plants. And the purpose of the hemp plants was, as you said, it was grown for fiber and seed oil and rope and material and cloth and clothes and things like that. And then the drug plants had the THC in them and they were dried, trimmed, cured, and you could tell the difference between the two plants clearly. That is no longer the case. Now you a, a, a hemp flower looks just like a cannabis, a THC flower, which is why hemp flowers are still prohibited because you can't tell the difference between the two. Hmm. Now, what's what's happened, and now I'm, okay. So in 2018, in 2018, Congress passed the Farm Act. And in that act, that law, it removed hemp from the definition of marijuana. So it took hemp out of the Con Controlled Substance Act. The problem or the challenge that we have now is that they defined, Congress defined hemp as the cannabis plant, including seeds, isomers, salts, um, with a Delta-9 concentration of not more than 0.3%. So in plain language, what that definition means 
is that all products that are sourced from the cannabis plant that contain not more than 0.3% of Delta-9 THC um, are hemp, okay? So the plain meaning of that definition is that you are hemp as long as you do not have more than 0.3% of Delta-9 THC. So as soon as the Farm Act was passed, we started seeing, I mean, it's a clever industry, we started seeing um, products that said that they were hemp products, hemp-derived products, and that they did not contain Delta-9, they contained either Delta-8 or Delta-10, and now we're up to... Um, THC zero, THC eight. I mean, we have lots and lots of different um, synthetic products out there now that allegedly don't contain more than 0.3% of Delta nine. And they're on the market and you're right. We're seeing them everywhere. Now, when we look, we're in a better position than other states are because at least the flavored vaping products like cake and the other, you see a lot of flavored Delta-8, Delta-10 and other synthetic intoxicating hemp products out there. But if they're flavored, our um, tobacco sales law captures them because our tobacco sales law prohibits all flavored vaping products, regardless of nicotine content. So Meredith um, O'Leary's program, your Tobacco Control Collaborative, can capture those, can find on those product, products and can capture those products, which a, a lot of the products are flavored vaping products. So those aren't a concern in Massachusetts now because all flavored vaping products are covered by the Massachusetts law. The challenge is the other ones, as you said, the edible products that are everywhere. Um, I've got one on my screen now, Nerdy Bears Delta 8 Gummies. And it's advertised as compliant with the Farm Act, the 2018 Farm Act. Um, it has Delta 8. THC and CBD in it, and it comes in assorted flavors. And right on the advertising, it says it's extremely potent. <laughs> right on the advertising, it says it's extremely potent. And the packaging looks like gummy bears. It looks, and, and, and the products out there now, they look like Doritos, goldfish, um, gummy bears. And, and then also we have the beverages out there now, um, the seltzers that, that contain these products. So, and you you explained it nicely. I mean, what is Delta-8 and Delta-10 and these other products? They are an isomer of Delta-9. So they're the same atoms, but they're arranged differently. And you're right, they are found naturally in a cannabis plant, but in minuscule amounts. Um, one of the scientists that's looked at this has said that to produce Delta-8 naturally with the necessary isolation purification required, you would need to produce about 122,000 pounds of hemp to get 2.2 pounds of natural Delta-8 at a cost of $22 million. So the claims that these are natural hemp-derived products is not true. These claims are not true. And he basically said calling Delta-8 THC a hemp-derived or natural product is the equivalent of calling codeine a poppy-derived natural herbal supplement. 
So we're seeing these now in candy, cookies, gummies, drinks, um, lots of infused beverages. So that that's the that's the problem um, that we have. And we know that these products are getting they're intoxicating products. That's how they're advertised as and, and if you just look at some of the ads out there, you know, you'll see a lot of them or I see a lot of them on Facebook that say, you know, you'll never get a hangover again, um, meaning that, you know, you're going to get high, but you're going to get high not from alcohol. You're going to get high from these hemp infused beverages. So I, I think we all know the public health concerns with this and also the fact that you know they're not age restricted um and you can find them anywhere um and and there was there was actually a lawsuit in California where um the nerdy bear manufacturers um were being sued by another company because that company said that they violated their trademark um, and, and they're trying to copy what the other company looks like. We don't care about the trademark issue, but the question before the court was, are these legal products? Are these actually um, legal products or are they prohibited products? If they're prohibited, if they're illegal products, then the trademark doesn't matter because you can't trademark an illegal product. So that was the decision um, before the court, whether federal law prohibited the sale of Delta-8. So I'm not going to tell you the decision of that case right now. Um, I'm going to give you, um, so that you stay awake for the rest of this, but I'm going to give you what the governmental side, both the federal and the state, both federal and Massachusetts, have said about these products. And the Drug Enforcement Agency claims that Delta-8 and every other synthetic product are still covered by the Controlled Substance Act. They claim that all synthetically derived products are Schedule One controlled substances. Um, because they're synthetic and they have to be extracted from the plant and then refined through a manufacturing process. And they say that it was clearly the congressional intent was to legalize only industrial hemp and not psychoactive substances like Delta-8. So that's what the federal government says. Um, the MDAR, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, finally issued a policy statement in writing in 2021. I asked them for that in writing in 2020. Or, yeah, in a, yeah right, right before COVID, I asked them for that statement. And I got it about 18 months later because this was really becoming a challenge for boards of health. And what they say is that any food product that contains hemp or CBD, um, any animal feed containing these products um, are, are not approved for sale. And they also said in this written guidance that failure to comply may result in enforcement action from either MDAR, the Department of Public Health, or the local Board of Health or law enforcement. So they say it may. And then when people started seeing these products and calling MDAR, they were told to contact their local Board of Health. Mm -hmm. And that's what they have been doing since 2018. Um, we started seeing it because our tobacco control programs started getting complaints from folks in their in their cities and towns and they came to mahb and said what do we do you know we, we we're not getting any help with enforcement from anybody and we want to enforce on these products so we create we drafted a sample template um on these products that has been updated since 
we initially drafted it in 2018. So what have other state agencies said about these products? DPH did issue a guidance document in 2019 that basically said the products that contain um, hemp, CBD, synthetic cannabis, they are adulterated food products that CBD has never been approved as a um, ingredient that can be put into food. And because these products are not approved ingredients, they the, the products that contain them are adulterated. And therefore, they're a violation of the food code. So who enforces the food code? Local boards of health enforce the food code. And we also received, got a statement um, from the ABCC, the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission, saying that alcoholic beverages cannot contain THC or CBD. However, they've the Cannabis Control Commission has a different approach to that now that we'll talk about in a minute. So everyone started getting, um, this, this started to become pretty public. And recently, the Globe did a feature article on the front page about these products. And they talked about the loopholes that, you know, okay, so they're illegal because they violate the food code. DEA says they're illegal. MDAR says they're illegal. Um, but nobody is doing enforcing unless it's a local board of health that's doing the enforcing. So, and, and, and different products are cropping up. You know, you may get rid of one of them and then there's a brand new one. So we've got that whack-a-mole situation like we have with tobacco, but we don't have anyone that's actually funded to do this enforcement. So, um, the MDAR, MDAR actually finally has a hemp program coordinator. And she sent an email. I, I emailed her and she emailed me back and said to me and to the health director that, that I was providing TA to that both food and beverage products containing hemp-derived cannabinoids including THC and CBD are prohibited in Massachusetts. So we have written, and, and we also have something in writing from the Cannabis Control Commission, um, because liquor stores started seeing um, drinks with actual Delta-9 in them, which is the marijuana, the, the the natural THC, but it's Delta-9, they started seeing Delta-9 drinks um, being brought in by their distributors. They're seltzer, they're, they're cannabis-infused drinks. And they called, they didn't, this was a store, Redstone's Liquors in Reading, and the owner of the store called the Cannabis Control Commission and said, you know, I'm being told by the health department that these products are not legal, but my distributor is telling me that they are legal. And the CCC finally got back to this store owner and said, they're legal if they're sold in marijuana establishments. You have to have a license to sell these and and they have to have a license from the Cannabis Control Commission. So now the true Delta 9 cannabis infused products can be sold, but only in marijuana establishments. They can't be sold in convenience stores or grocery stores or anywhere else. And what the distributors are saying is, well, marijuana is legal in Massachusetts, so now you can sell these products. Well, marijuana is legal in Massachusetts, but it can only be sold in marijuana establishments. So um, what I've done is I've put together 
um, all of the documents in writing that I could find from the state agencies um, and supporting documentation from the state agencies that refer to the documents that have been mentioned in the emails. And most of the documents, most of the, the statements are in writing their emails, their public documents from the state agencies to me or to, to a colleague of mine, but it's in writing and it's from all of the state agencies. And they all agree that these products are, should not be sold because they, violate the food code right now. They just violate the food code because they're not approved ingredients. Now, we'll go back to the case in California. So the case in California, what the court did, and this is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, which is a very, usually a very liberal um, circuit court of appeals. But what they found, their holding was that because Delta-8 does not have less than, does not have more than 0.3% of Delta-9 in it, that it's legal, that the plain meaning of the Farm Act can't help but lead you to the conclusion that Delta-8 products or any synthetically derived product is legal if it has less than 0.3% of Delta-9 because it's hemp derived. Um, the, the law, the, the Farm Act doesn't make any mention of synthetic at all. Um, and they basically say in the decision, and I'm quoting now, regardless of the wisdom of legalizing Delta-8 THC products, this court will not substitute its own policy judgment for that of Congress. If the defendant is correct and Congress inadvertently created a loophole legalizing vaping products containing Delta-8, then it is for Congress to fix its mistake. Now, we are not covered, the, the decision in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is not binding on us. We're in the First Circuit Court of Appeals. So that decision does not present a problem um, for us in moving forward. Congress should really fix this, but we don't really need Congress to fix it to be able to enforce on these products because they violate our food code right now. Um, the question is, who is gonna do the enforcing? So what some municipalities have done is that they have enacted regulations that prohibit these products even though you don't have to enact a regulation to prohibit them because they're illegal. So, you know, banning heroin, you know, you, you, you don't have to pass a regulation to ban heroin. It's, it's a class, it's, it's an illegal drug. So you don't have to pass a regulation to enforce the food code on these products because boards of health have the legal authority to pass the food code. So, that's the pickle that we're in. I will say that Senator Joe Comerford contacted me. She will be holding a hearing. I believe it's June 11th. It's very preliminary, but the legislature is getting complaints, which they should, from folks. They've heard that these state agencies are not, you know, they've, they've said that they're illegal, but they haven't, um, you know, they haven't enforced it. So the legislature is looking at regulating these products, further regulating these products, and they're just getting some preliminary information from scientists, from the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting now because now the cannabis lobbyists are on the same side as the public health lobbyists because it's interfering with their business because they're regulated from door to dumpster. Whereas these other products, these synthetic intoxicating products aren't. So, you know, uh, you know, it, it's, I've never gone to bed with the tobacco industry and I, I don't want to do it with this industry either, but you know, we're on the same side for different reasons, but you know, they, they're, they're illegal. They shouldn't be sold in Massachusetts, but they are. 
being sold in Massachusetts. So that's my story. It's a long one. It's, it's a long one. one. <laughs> um, do you know what people around us are doing? We know that Northampton, this actually sent a letter, was really focused on creative, but included some of the synthetic can cannabinoids. Yeah, um, I was with Meredith yesterday at another meeting, and yeah, they sent out a letter, and they've had pretty good success in getting some of these products out. They also have their... Um, inspectors look for these products when they go in to stores. Um, where has prohibited um, these products and they've included Kratom in the products that are prohibited. Kratom has a following, they've, they've got a uh, membership association and um, they're opposing some of these regulations because in where they are banning Kratom. And the association is saying we should be regulating it, not banning it. Um, so we have Beverly has done it. Fall River has done it. Um, where has done it. And there are others that have done it, but they haven't done it to the a lot of them had done the first regulation that we, we did, was, which was to age restrict these products, put them behind the counters, require um, certain testing. But now that it's clear that they're illegal, you know, those regulations really don't make, they should be banned. You know, we shouldn't be regulating an illegal product. So we have some old ones. So we do have some new, Needham is looking at it right now. I drafted one for them. Um, so people are now looking at, um, at, at what to do. You know, ideally I would love it if, you know, if, if, if DPH wants local boards of health to, to enforce using the food code, then they need to give us some resources to do that. Mm. I mean, is because this is huge, you know, this is, this is huge and it's dangerous and kids can get these, they can get them online. They can get them in any store. And it's, it's right now, the only ones doing anything are health directors and health inspectors that are going in and saying, take these things off the shelf. They're illegal and giving them, you know, the, the guidance documents that we have, and some are giving them the packet that, um, I will send you that that you can give. They're just giving the packet to the retailers and hoping that that's going to be enough to let them to get them off the shelves. And it is in some cases, and it isn't in others. So, Cheryl, when you said in where that they've banned kratom, is that did they? Is there a regulation banning yes. it, or how do they do yes. that? Yes, um, it's Andrea Crete. Right, you know Andrea. Yeah, um, and we, we heard from her, I think, at the PVTC meeting, right, Maureen? Yes, you, you did. I was there. You were there, yes. you were there too. And, and yeah. we have that, I drafted that regulation for them, and yeah, they banned it. And they used the fining structure for the tobacco regulations. So mm -hmm. 1000 for the first offense, 2000 then 5000 and suspensions. And you can't suspend, I mean, you can't permit these products because they're illegal, mm -hmm. but you could pull, if they have one, a tobacco permit, or you could pull a milk permit or whatever permits you issue, you could pull. Right. So Kratom isn't currently illegal in the way that these synthetic cannabinoids are. No, no. Are. It, okay, it's so in it's a, a world of its own. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I think it's in a different category yeah. than synthetic yeah. products. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a plant, a, a Southeast Asian plant. Right that is also hallucinatory, um, but it also has been used by people who are um, trying to get off of heroin. Mm. Um, it's a product that they use to help with the withdrawals right. from heroin. Which is, so it's, which is, it's controversial. Yeah. You it's know, controversial. It's, it, That's why the harm reduction community is not in favor of bans exactly. for that reason. But, exactly. but what's problematic is there's no quality control of this product. So nobody knows how much of it, it, it needs. It, it needs to be regulated. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it does. I, I, 
you know, in full transparency, my son was addicted to heroin. He's been clean for over 10 years now, but he was addicted and he used Kratom to deal with the withdrawals, but he was getting in. I mean, this was, well, this was over 10 years ago, going into Harvard Square and getting it, you know, my daughter would drive him in. Um, and who knows? I mean, he was lucky it didn't kill him. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's no regulation, which is, which is needed. I mean, we need regulation. And even the industry will say that. The Kratom folks will say that. Um, um, so it, it is, I just wanted to say, it's super complicated. And, and this was a very thorough summary, which I really appreciate, um, Cheryl. But I did want to say that- I can I send you ask, the slides. I'll send yeah, you the slides. That would be great. So then I think obviously the concern, you know, products with Delta-8 in them are more concerning than say other products that might have CBD in them, you know, that are in, so, but, but I, what I heard from you is that any product, any product that you ingest that has CBD in it, whether or not it has psychoactive properties of right. Delta-8 is still technically illegal. It's technically illegal. And, and, and here's the, this just blows my mind. Um, T8, edible THC products are legal. Whereas edible CBD products, even ones that are not intoxicating, are not legal. And that doesn't make any sense, except that when the Cannabis Control Commission wrote their regulations, they um, exempted edible cannabis products from the definition of food so that they're not violating the food code because they're not food. It, it, it makes no sense. Mm. But I mean, if we had regulations on CBD, we could do the same thing. If, if, if you're not talking about intoxicated synthetic products, you're talking about real CBD that farmers grow, you know, we could have a regulation that does that, but we don't have any CBD regulations. Mm. And if you talk to, um, the Cannabis Control Commission, I mean, here's all the the bureaucratic frustration. It just makes your head want to explode because if a liquor store, if, if a health director or inspector goes into a liquor store and finds a Delta 9 infused beverage in the liquor store and they call the Cannabis Control Commission and say, this store is selling a marijuana infused product, the Cannabis Control commission will say we don't regulate we only regulate in marijuana establishments you're going to have to call your local board of health so they're they don't care i mean i shouldn't say they don't care but they do not intend to regulate these places that are illegally selling cannabis products mm. no i mean so it's it, it's it and in, in the can and mdar says they don't enforce either it's the local boards of health they will say they're illegal, but they will say they don't have an enforcement mechanism. So again, we're back to local boards of health enforcing the food code. Mm -hmm. wow. So I will be testifying um, at the hearing and I will be testifying on behalf of boards of health and the, you know, the frustration that we feel and the position that we're being put in and that we need, you know, that, that if someone could take this off our shoulders or give us resources um, to add it to our plate, then we'd feel better about this. So is, are any boards of health sending letters to alcohol retailers saying that these Delta yes. 9 products should be pulled off the shelves as well? Yes. Okay. And who's looking at that? <laughs> you know, that's the other well, thing. Well, I mean, the only people who are looking at it is us. Yeah. Like to go in, unless you get a complaint from someone or Unless whatever. we get a complaint. Yeah. yeah. Oops. I haven't. I'm busy. I have a visitor. <laughs> we can't, we can't see your visitor. No. They're, they're behind the backdrop. So yeah. That's okay. My background. <laughs> A naked baby, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm. 
So, and then one other question, Cheryl, when you said that this letter that has like some boards of health, including Northampton have sent out a letter requesting for, you know, here's the list of all the stuff, please pull it up. And you said they've had some success. So how is, what do you know about that success? Just that when the inspectors go in to the stores in Northampton, they're not finding them on the shelves anymore. Oh, wow. Okay. And are they sending, is Northampton also regulating alcohol establishments for the Delta now or talking? I'm about pretty sure they are. Um, yeah. I don't know how frequently they go into alcohol establishments, but they do because they yep. give them permits as well. Right. You know, most people don't want to break the law. So, you know, and again, we're about compliance, not about punishment. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we can go into a store and say these are illegal, take them off the shelves. That's great. You know, and that works probably and most of the time it'll work, but it won't work always, especially when they're getting mixed messages from their distributors. Right. And this also includes things at Whole Foods, like doesn't Whole Foods sell cannabis infused things, you know, like they sell and CBD. CBD, they yeah. sell CBD, but not edible CBD. They sell lotion and tinctures and some other things. Yeah, but they don't sell edible. And hemp hearts are hemp derived, but that's a food that's not considered an adulterated food, right? Is that a food that's, is that also illegal? Technically? What's a hemp heart? I don't know what a hemp I heart mean, you is. Can, they're like, you know, you can get hemp seeds or hemp hearts that oh, are like yeah. edible. Oh yeah, those, you know, those are not, there, there's a list of products. If you go to the MDR, MDR website, there's, there's like hemp oil and there are some other hemp products that are not illegal. They are GSAS. I forget what that means. Good. There's evidence supporting that they're safe. So yeah, there are some products that are fine. Okay. And they're listed out. Got it. So I guess it's, you know, we wanted to bring this up to have everyone informed. Unfortunately, we don't have a great um, attendance at our meeting today, which is too bad, but um you know, the eventual goal, I think, Maureen, was for the board to try to figure out, do we want to do something like what Northampton is doing or what Ware is doing or Fall River, other places? Yeah, it, you know, certainly asking isn't hard, <laughs> but then, no. you, um, then the question is, if, if there's a regulation, it, it, it probably doesn't hurt to have it, even if you can't uh, thoroughly enforce it. You know, because then if it is noted by uh, by a food inspector or or other other people that then you can enforce it. It it just it it just would be nice if there was like like Cheryl was saying some sort of support for enforcement and some and it would be even nicer if there was a statewide kind of uh, uh, program. Yeah. Um, so is that all you need from me for can now? I Risha a question? No, go ahead. Yeah, Not just right. yet. Thank go ahead, Risha. I, um, I just want to make sure I'm clear on, it was a lot to digest, even though I did actually re watch some of the stuff beforehand and read some of the stuff beforehand. Um, the... The options in front of us are you're breaking up. You're breaking up. You're breaking up, Risha. Regulation. I'm, I'm in San Francisco. I don't know if. <laughs> oh, I didn't catch the question. Did anyone? I, no. Maybe turn your camera off, Risha. See if that helps with your bandwidth. So good. Before. What are the options? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Oh. <laughs> um I'm just trying okay. I will I will ask the question at another time. We so Risha, if you can turn your camera off, that might help. She did. Oh there, there it is. Okay. Try again. No. Um trying to understand what the options in front of us are. It sounds like regulations, letters, that was the part I wasn't entirely clear on. Yeah, um, the options are, um, you could just go into the stores um, with the guidance documents from um, DPH, 
with the written documentation from MDAR and from the Cannabis Control Commission and tell them that these are about having these products violate the food code um, and need to be taken off the shelf. You could um, mail, you could send letters or emails, whatever, to all of the stores saying the same thing. Um, or you could enact a regulation that would prohibit all of these products and you could fine them, um, you know, a thousand, two thousand, five thousand if you find them on the shelves. Okay. Hmm. And is there any role for us in supporting the work that Joe Comerford or others are doing at a yes. 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 Um, if she she really appreciates hearing from her constituents, um, and you should let your reps and senators know um, that this is a real concern because that's why she's holding a hearing is because she's heard from so many um, municipal officials about this, especially health directors and board of health members. Yeah, maybe we should write a letter from the board. Yeah, of health. that would be great. Right. She gets it. I mean, she gets the problem. Mm -hmm. But it helps to. Spread. Yeah, yeah. The more the more support she gets, the better off she is, obviously. Anything else, Risha? No, thank you. That was it. OK. OK, um, Kiko, I will send you the slides. I will also send you the packet that I put together. Um, probably okay. tomorrow morning. Perfect. This was so helpful. Thank you, Cheryl. Oh, you're entirely welcome. And I'll... before before we let you go, we did want to ask you, so we we spent the first part of this meeting talking about our tobacco regulations, and we've had lots of good conversations, and I think we're ready, or we, I'll say Risha and Maureen are ready to do a draft. So Maureen, okay. did you want to ask Cheryl about her availability? Yeah, I, do, I just wondered um, if you could, t you, you were really helpful in getting us started on this. Sure. And I, I added a lot of the wording from the, the state uh, sample there, and then we changed some things about okay. our regulation. And I just wondered if you could take another look at Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Where we bring it back to the full board and sure. ready to vote. Okay. Well, Rish and I will work on it and try to get okay. that several weeks it sounds yeah, like you're i'm happy to take another look at it i'm writing grant applications for the next 10 days so i'm okay, a little and it's, you have right your now. hearing on the <laughs> coming up so i understand um that you've got a lot on your plate but i'll we'll get this as together as we can and then Great. send it to you for one one happy week. to look at it i appreciate that okay and then i will say goodbye all right. Have a good rest of your meeting. Thank, Thank you very you so much. Bye-bye. Very helpful. Yeah, that'll be a meeting worth reviewing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, that was it's recorded. <laughs> a lot of information. Um, it really helped me though. At first I thought, oh no, I'm more confused when she was talking, but by the end of it all, I feel like I finally got clarity on everything. So yeah, that was good. Right. Um, and the, it sounds like having those documents too will be really helpful. Um, yeah. all right, where are we? I don't know if there's an, I don't think I have anything to add at this point on this subject. I think it's something to digest and, and bring forward. Um, Lauren, any, do you have any thoughts? Are you still with us? I know you had to leave early. Yeah, I don't know if she's saying. Yeah, I, I'm traveling. I'm still here. I'm traveling and listening. So I'll share my thoughts at, at another, the next okay. meeting. Okay. Oh, great. great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Risha, did you have anything you wanted to share? I know it's a lot to digest. No, I, I think, yeah, digesting. And I, I would support a letter, although I'm not sure entirely what I would put as a content. So I leave that to you. Yeah, I think just say this is, needs to be looked at on the state level, uh, you know, and, and the boards of health need support to help 
curb these sales of these products that are illegal. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe me, Kiko, you can help me write something. Yeah, we can, we can definitely do that. And the, the other thing I'm also curious about is just how much of the stuff is on the shelves in Amherst. Cause I just don't know. I haven't gone. Out I know. I don't go to convenience stores that much. Yeah. Go. I don't know where else that would be. I mean, maybe uh wild, whatever it is. Wild uh, type. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, um, or other kind of like funky little stores. I don't know. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So I guess the next um, item on the agenda is the director's update. Yep. So I have just a few items. Um, you know, certainly we think of ourselves as being out of the respiratory illness season right now with COVID wastewater levels being pretty low and, you know, flu levels, flu hospitalizations being pretty low, but we're already thinking about gearing up for the fall. Um, mm -hmm. So working with Northampton through the Public Health Excellence Grant to be scheduling some flu and COVID clinics and really trying to get more out into the community. We were in a couple of um, housing complexes last year, which was really successful. So, you know, it's good to have the clinics here at the Bank Center, but it's also good to go to people. So it's going to be a combination. So we're starting that already to plan for that. Great. Yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted to say in terms of the kindness campaign, you know, I've talked about that a couple of times here. It did wrap up at the end of April, technically. Um, we're keeping the spirit of the campaign alive through a couple of mental wellness workshops that um, Lauren has been really instrumental in helping us set up, um, working with the Youth Mental Health Coalition in Springfield. And those are happening next week and the week after. There are two different ones. So um, youth are required to register ahead of time, and um, one of them is a poetry workshop, just encouraging young people to um, get in touch with their emotions, be able to express them as a way of having optimal mental wellness. So that's exciting that that will happen. Hopefully we'll get a good turnout. Um, in general, the workshops that we held on mental health and suicide were not well attended. And we really understand that these are difficult topics for people to talk about. And there wasn't, I guess, enough community concern around them for people to show up for workshops. So that wasn't as successful, but we did get a lot of people thanking us for doing the kindness campaign and understanding the connection between being kind and mental wellness and community health. So it was a good first start, uh, first step, and I think we'll try to do it again. The community cleanup, which come, you know, the culmination of the kindness campaign was a community cleanup on the 27th of April. And we got a bunch of people out, including some town councilors and collected a lot of garbage and recycling. And that was a fun community event. A lot of people just came together and made friends. And so that was a good it's community good. kind of development, uh, building. Sort of every event. one of those events, I was somewhere else. So yeah. I, I get to connect with it myself. <laughs> I did um, find that when I was thinking about it and looking for the dates though, on like the town website, it was a little hard to find, but not that that, um, yeah. Limit. I mean, I don't think that's the way these things get um, advertised or promoted anyway, but I well, I remember finding it a little difficult. So that's sort of that how to get it, get it to people's attention is, is the tricky part. I think that's a really good point and something that we did struggle with a little bit. We had um, a, a website, which is part of this Engage platform, where people were supposed to be able to go and upload stories about random acts of kindness or photographs or what have you, and that was not successful. And I think the website is one tool, but for this kind of really community-engaged type of work, you just have to get the information out in a more individual way or personal way, and we didn't do that kind of outreach. So those are all things to think about for, for next time. Um, yeah, so we'll see. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention is that we, we are hiring a communications manager. So the town has been without a communications oh. manager for some time. And I've been fortunate enough to be on that interview panel. So we have a couple of candidates. And that would have been helpful to have someone in that role to help promote yeah. the kindness campaign. We did not have yeah. someone. We did our best with scarce resources. So I understand. And I, yeah. <laughs> but it's good <laughs> feedback. I appreciate it. Um, so the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control, Control District, we have this contract with them. They're wonderful. They're starting their surveillance efforts. They're going to start treatment efforts in early June in a part of North Amherst where a West Nile positive mosquito was found at the end of the season last year. So proactive treatment in an area that we know had West Nile last year. Um, 
And I wanted to ask board members whether I whether you would like to see the report that they send out um, every season. They just send out a spring report. It's very well done and it has great photographs and is very kind of informative about mosquito surveillance and treatment. So I can send that out to people if you'd like to see it. Sure. Okay. Yes, please. Okay, great. And the other thing that we want to work on, and Risha, thank you for sending us some references, is a one pager about spraying, because I think a lot of people wonder about whether that's something they should do on their own properties. I reached out to John Briggs, who is the director of Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. I haven't heard from him yet, but Kyle has a draft going or starting to work on a draft of an educational handout, something or rather to put on the website to have in the office about, um, you know, we have lots of things about how to protect yourself from mosquito bites, long sleeves, insect repellent, all that kind of stuff that we know well, but spraying, we don't have any good educational material about the pros and cons of that. So we're going to work on that um, based on with some of the stuff that you sent our way. So thanks for that. And we'll keep you posted. Um, the opioid abatement funds, there was a really nice article. Right. In the, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Me. Go ahead. Um, when, because I know that the um, some folks on the Amherst Parents Listserv had asked about it. Is there um, is there a time where I could let them know to be looking for something or? Um, so Kyle, do you wanna chime in about how long you think you might take to work on that? What's a reasonable time frame for you? Yeah, I started a draft. Um, to be quite honest, I haven't been able to work on it that closely today. Um, I'll definitely work on it tomorrow. So probably early next week, I'll get that out. Yeah, I think we can get something. And Kyle's in the middle of graduating from school, so he has a lot on his plate. Yeah, taking some of your time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we can get you something, um, you know, get something, a draft, maybe to share with you, Risha. I would love your input if you're interested, or if you don't want to give input, that's fine. We can just send you a final copy um, by the end of the month or early next month. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure because I think this is the time that people are starting to think about it. And sure. so making sure we get it out to people before they've made decisions that they would have changed had they known more. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that makes total sense. I mean, we'll definitely prioritize it. Kyle will, Kyle and I will work on it together. Really so. getting mailings with and I'm happy process of spraying in your yeah. yard. Yeah. Right now. Okay. Um, so just two other things. Should I move on to the next? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention the opioid abatement funds. So um, there was an article in the paper about how the local community, Hampshire County, and then Amherst in particular, are approaching this whole issue. Um, we're still in the needs assessment phase, um, but we are beginning to buy some supplies like harm reduction supplies and working closely with Craig stores um, to make sure that their guests who are who are using drugs are supported and that they have the infrastructure at the shelter to be able to respond to an overdose. So we're doing that right now, but still working on a plan for further spending of this money, which comes in, you know, in a steady stream for the next 18 years. So um, more to come on that, but just wanted to let you know that we're sort of gearing up on that topic at this point. Um, and then the last thing is just the future of the board. That sounds ominous. It's not meant to sound ominous. It's mostly just drawing attention to the fact that three members are rolling off at the end of June. So Maureen and Tim's terms end at the end of June. And Lauren is, she was on for three years and then sort of renewed and is now making the decision to end her term a little early. So Lauren will also be rolling off at the end of June. So that leaves us with three vacancies. Um, and Paul, now that the town budget is finished, is turning his attention from those budgetary conversations to thinking about, um, uh, you know, having appointing new people to the Board of Health. And he does have strong some strong applicants already, people in mind. So that's a process that's it's happening and unfolding. And we should have some updates when we by when we meet next month. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think in terms of next month, one thing that Maureen and I talked about just briefly today was whether we wanted to try to have an in-person meeting, especially in light of the fact that several board members are leaving us. <laughs> It'd be nice to see people in person. So I kind of wanted to put that out there as an idea. 
Is that possible for you, Risha? Is that? That's yeah, I'm just looking at the calendar. So that's June 13th. Mm -hmm. uh, right now it's possible. Okay. Just wondered, just in a gen generic way, you know, but uh, yeah. whether. I think it sounds like a good idea and it, it's a little bit worrying to realize there's only two of us left. Is that, is that, am I, have I counted correctly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little unusual. It's usually one or two at a time and this is a little different. It is a little different. Um, yeah, so we're just wondering if we need to ramp up. Do we have enough people who are in the queue, or do we need to be doing more heavy recruitment? Um, my understanding from Paul is that he has um some candidates in the queue right. that he's very excited about. So I think we're pretty we're in good shape. And so um, the idea is that there it would be seamless. So there that by July we would have a full complement of board members again. So back Great. up to five, yeah, from the two that it will be just briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Only once. Yeah. Uh, hard to believe it's almost six years actually, no. but it's another dear, another question. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good that, that, that there are folks stepping forward. Yeah. Uh, and I, so no, any topics and not anticipated by the, chair no all right um then could we, i think could we have a motion to adjourn oh sorry before you do that i don't know if lauren if you're still listening in and if you had a thought about the in-person meeting idea if you're still hearing us um yeah that's fine and can i ask you a pico <laughs> wait what um, i didn't hear that <laughs> Oh, I said, um, yes, that is a good idea, the in-person meeting. And would it be possible for you uh, to read what I sent you? Because when I open my email, I can't speak. Oh, I don't yeah. think I did the 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 bike um, event justice, the, um, the roll, walk, and bike, the bike, uh -huh. walk, and roll. <laughs> Is it possible for you to read that? Yeah, let me see if I can find it. So this can be an agenda item that we didn't anticipate. <laughs> okay, um, Thank you. If that's okay. Um, so just that it was um, another successful walk, bike, and roll to school day. Uh, the community came together for a fantastic walk, bike, and roll to school day on, on Wednesday, I guess, May 1st. Um, while community partners, school-based administrators, teachers, and staff played a vital role in ensuring a successful and fun event for students, the vast majority of credit and thanks once again goes to our amazing ARPS parents and guardians. We're so grateful for the passion and dedication, not to mention the sheer volume of work they put in to make sure these safe walks to school events not only happen, but continue to grow year after year. Um, some details. While we're still working to figure out an engaging event for the middle school and high school, students walking, riding to those schools were well aware that they were participating in today's event regardless. All walkers and cyclists on Chestnut Street heading toward the middle and high schools affirmed they were part of the walk ride day. And at elementary schools, they had great events as well. There were, I think Lauren had mentioned, 30 families participating at Wildwood. Um, they had a banana stand reception at the school. Um, and then Dr. Kuo was also on hand to pass out swag um, and police escorting the crew from Pine and East Pleasant. So it was kind of a big deal, all hands on deck. Fort River had a huge event with 50 families, maybe more. There were bike rally points at Stanley Street, Kiwanis Field and various other places. Um, and police escorts helped out at both locations with comfort dog Augie and Officer Laramie in attendance. So well known those two. And then in Crocker Farm, they had 50 families and the principal and principal's assistants were very pleased that they found places for all of those bikes. Um, for the first time, they had a walking bus group come from Mount Holyoke and bike rally points at various places around South Amherst. So all in all, it was a nice event and a big success. So thanks, Lauren, for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. All right, I have to run, so I motion to close the meeting, or I just am going to hang up. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Thanks Risha. Uh, Lauren. Yes, I I, I uh, agree to um, end the meeting. Okay, and uh, meeting is adjourned. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there, Lauren and Risha. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Good night. Have a good night. Night-night.